I was a criminal defense lawyer for nearly 20 years. I built my reputation defending people accused of murder and never losing a jury trial. Mine was the kind of work that incites death threats, and I have received many. But none of that really bothered me. I loved my work, despite the sadness surrounding much of it, until I didn't. One day I was in court on a routine matter and my chest started hurting. I didn't know what was happening. All I knew was I needed to see a doctor. Well, it turned out to be a panic attack, but I didn't know that then. My doctor wanted to put me in the hospital overnight to check my heart. Word of advice, if you're a lawyer and you tell your doctor your chest is hurting, you will end up in the hospital, just saying. <laughs> so it turned out my heart was fine, but he wanted me to see a psychologist, which I did, and I ended up on Lexapro. I eventually left a perfectly successful career and took the next natural step. I started one of the first bean-to-bar chocolate factories in the U.S. over a decade ago. It's a small family business that I run with my daughter and 17 employees. We direct trade with cocoa farmers on three continents, share profits with them, and open our books to them. This month, I'll take my 42nd origin trip to meet with cocoa farmers in the Amazon. We engage with local students in our business, and we take high school students to Tanzania. And so far, we've provided over a million school lunches to malnourished children in Tanzania and the Philippines. Thank you. And I eat, I eat chocolate every day. And, and nobody has threatened to kill me yet. <laughs> My story is your story, the beginning of one thing and the ending of another. Perhaps you're sitting here today, maybe not with chest pains, but with a lack of fulfillment in your current work. Poet philosopher John O'Donohue describes this as a threshold, a transition, the in-between place of struggle. I found my new vocation as my first one was ending and you can too. Show of hands, how many of you have ever thought or heard a friend or family member express, I can't do this job anymore. I need to find a new inspiration. Or maybe I should ask for eyes closed and hands raised in case you're seated next to your, <laughs> next to your boss. But this problem is pervasive. It's not just me, it's most of us. Gallup says that two-thirds of the American workforce are disengaged and that 55% of executives aren't engaged at work. That's millions of people feeling dispassionate, unproductive, and unfulfilled at work, and maybe in their personal lives too. You can find your calling and meaningful work. My ending just happened to be the conclusion of a murder trial. Yours might be something else. So how did I navigate a career change and land on chocolate? Well, this is my path to a new vocation. But it isn't a prescription. But if you find yourself struggling in that threshold in between place, then this might be for you. You wanna know where you won't find your innermost calling? In the Google search box. It's not online. That distraction and noise is louder than ever. And you won't find it in a book either. I read Poe Bronson's What Should I Do With the Rest of My Life, thinking that he'd written a final chapter just for me in invisible ink <laughs> that said, Dear Sean, this is what you should do. No such luck. I looked at everything under the sun, buying a business, starting a business, but nothing was drawing me in. So where do we find our calling? It's often located at the intersection of our skill set, what the world needs, and our passion. Most people I talk to can articulate their skill set and even what the world needs. But many people share my challenge, which is, what is my passion? The harder I tried to find my next vocation, the further out of reach it seemed to be. It was like trying to grab fog. When I told my wife 
that I wanted to quit my law practice and start a chocolate factory, she asked if I couldn't just double up on my Lexapro dose. <laughs> and I said, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Let's talk about sorrow and bring in poet philosopher Khalil Gibran, who said, our greatest joy is our sorrow unmasked. This is the hidden mystery of life. I talk to groups of all ages, and when I ask middle schoolers if they know what it feels like to have a broken heart, yes, they say, heads nodding, I know what that feels like. But when I pose the same question to middle-aged professionals, many sit stone-faced. No, not really. Nobody's died in my family. I've never really suffered or faced a tragedy. Really? What kind of life are you living? We need to get you a new life. We need to break that heart wide open. Grief and sorrow are just the other side of love. And a full life is filled with love's lost. Parents, spouses, children, friends, our health, marriages, all unplanned endings. And if those endings don't take us to our knees in surrender from the weight of heartache, then we must have held back. My great sorrow so far was when my dad died of lung cancer when I was 14. He was a lawyer too, a physically fit former Marine, my hero. When I was 13, I was giving him Demerol shots for pain. This was before hospice and my mom just couldn't bring herself to do it. A prayer group from church would come over and lay hands on him and speak in tongues and say that he would be healed. Don't ever talk with your dad about death, the leader said, because if you do, it'll be a sign of doubt and Jesus won't heal him. So we never talked about it. Whenever he tried to bring it up, I just pushed it away. The cancer spread throughout his body and to his brain. He was in bed, clearly sick, even though the week before he'd been in court trying a case. I was talking to him and then he died right in front of me. It was the most desperate moment of my life. I begged God out loud, please don't let him die. Please let him live. And he died. I spent the next 25 years proving to God that I didn't need him and turning away from what really matters in life. After years of disregarding my own broken heart, I finally had to have a conversation with the grief and sorrow in my life. I knew that something was up. So I did what you do when trying to get to the bottom of pain and chaos in your soul. I bought a convertible Mercedes. <laughs> I thought, that'll do it. Nope, I actually only kept it four months, but, but I wanna share with you my secret to finding purpose and meaning. This secret is a paradox that brought clarity and healing to my life. And I found this secret in the most unlikely of places. Still a lawyer, trying cases, but desperately searching for a new path. I started volunteering in the palliative care department of a local hospital. It's like hospice in the hospital. I would usually go on Fridays and the director of the program would give me a list of patients who'd asked for a visit. Most of them were in some stage of dying. I would talk with them about their younger days, work, family, pie recipes, whatever they wanted to talk about. Sometimes I read to people. One day I was asked to visit a middle-aged man who was in the ICU and dying from end-stage liver failure. When I arrived, the nurses were inverting his bed to try and raise his blood pressure to keep him alive until a distant family member could arrive. He had nobody. He was in a coma and unresponsive. I put my hand on his forearm and started reading to him gently out loud. As I read, I could see tears forming in the corners of his eyes and running down the side of his face one by one. I always ended my visits by asking people if they'd like me to pray for them. 
And I learned that most people who are dying will take a prayer if offered. I wasn't there to win souls or make a spiritual cold call, but the conversation deepened with the simple question, what would you like me to pray for? I listened and prayed whatever they asked. Would you pray that I live two more weeks to celebrate my 60th wedding anniversary? Would you pray that I die today, I'm in pain and ready to go? Would you pray that I'm healed and can walk out of here? Or would you pray that my family's okay after I die? I prayed their prayer word for word without judgment. I'd usually ask if I could touch their arm or hold their hand while I prayed their words back to them. Let's face it, we spend most of our days thinking about us. We think about ourselves a lot. I know I did and do to this very day. But those were some of the few moments in my life, really measured in seconds, when I actually thought about somebody else besides me. There were times when I would leave the hospital and walk to my car in the parking lot, and it felt like my feet weren't touching the ground. It was as if I was walking on air. What is that? What could it be? It's joy. It's unmistakable joy. It's the unmasking of the great sorrow buried deep within me. The joy that I felt during those years at the hospital gave me space to consider a new path. My new passion emerged, making chocolate from scratch, during those years volunteering at the hospital. And within three months of that idea, I was in the Amazon learning how farmers grow cocoa beans. I returned home and started to wind down my law practice and build a chocolate factory. Our passion paradoxically surfaces when we create space by serving someone other than ourselves. Someone needs your broken heart. Find them. Don't wait. Gandhi said, if you want to find yourself, lose yourself in the service of others. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. They're both saying, die to self. You will serve someone and expect nothing in return, yet you will be transformed. You won't be the healer giving service to the healed. The roles will reverse. You will be healed. And you might be saying, but I am serving by being on the board of our local United Way campaign, or I'm serving by giving money to alleviate homelessness in my town. That's great, but it's not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder human connection. And you might ask, but how do I connect my sorrow with service? Here's how. The key is that it's in the same lane as our own pain. If I could ask only one question of pe people searching for their calling, it would be this. Where does it hurt? Where does it hurt? Meditate on that. Pray on that. Ask, please reveal someone who needs me in the way I needed someone when my sorrow was born. Do this work and you'll be creating space for clarity in your life. If it's passion you seek, then your own heightened skills of discernment will guide you. This is the work, the secret, the bridge. It's not the end, but it's the part of the threshold that's on the other side. Finding your vocation isn't a destination. For me, it means that I keep going on Cocoa Origin trips, and a 60-plus hour door-to-door -door trip to get where I'm going in Tanzania isn't easy. I don't delegate relationships with cocoa farmers to someone else. And even now, 12 years later, I still meet with students. Once you find it, don't stop. It's a daily practice of staying tethered to it, to remind you of why you were drawn to it in the first place. Because now you know what to look for. 
What if you let these signposts lead you home? Can you imagine how fulfilled you might become? What if you unmask your sorrow, go to the place where it hurts, and serve someone out of that spot in your own broken heart? In those moments, time will stand still, and you will know what it means to be joyfully alive. And maybe your feet won't touch the ground. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.